This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. The great English poet and writer, William Shakespeare, dramatized the assassination of Julius Caesar in his dramatic tragedy of the same name. Early in the play, a soothsayer warns Caesar to beware the Ides of March, as Caesar was leaving to participate in festivities of the day. As emperor of Rome and spiritual head of the empire, Julius Caesar would have naturally been expected to participate in the public festivities during this important day, despite the seer's prophecy to Ides of March. Even though his wife, Calphurnia, prompted by troubled prophetic dreams of her own, also employed her husband to stay home, Caesar would not be swayed. In fact, The historian Plutarch wrote that Caesar was defiant in the face of such admonitions, boasting to the seer moments before his death that the Ides of March had come and her prophecy had not been fulfilled. To this the seer replied, Aye, Caesar, but not gone. When Caesar arrived at the theater of Pompeii, where the Roman Senate met, he was stabbed to death by a group of more than 60 conspirators led by the senators, his friends, Brutus and Cassius, former friends turned enemies in the face of the emperor's unchecked ambition. Shakespeare has the dying dictator say in Latin, as he recognizes his one-time friend Brutus among the assassins, et tu, Brute? In English, you too, Brutus? That too, Brute, indeed. That the conspirators, Caesar's closest political allies, chose the Ides of March to enact their plot was no coincidence. Not only was it a day that they would count on having access to the emperor, but the religious implications of the day would also have been at the forefront of their minds. By killing their leader on a day of sacrifice, the conspirators were sending a message that their leader's blood was an offering to the gods shed for the continued prosperity of their nation. And it shouldn't be any surprise that many of the psychopathic conspiracies to make major regime changes have happened on or right around the Ides of March symbolically. Because people who want to accomplish major sweeping world-changing moments Pick dates like that. You know, the Ides of March has been used frequently as that world-changing date. What other world-changing, history-changing moment happened on the Ides of March? Think about it. It was on the Ides of March, March 15th, 1917, that Tsar Nicholas II of Russia abdicated the Russian throne, and the age of Marxist-Leninist communism began. The first communist nation in the world, the Soviet Union. Beware the Ides of March. So with this in mind, let our minds search back a bit to January of 2020, let's say. And if you are a long-time listener to my podcast, The Causes of Things, or if you've ever heard me speak at any one of the venues that I've spoken at before 2020, you know that I have been warning that we were in the midst of a cultural revolution, an American cultural revolution, a cultural revolution that to work had to be top-down, bottom-up, and inside-out. It did have to be top-down first, legislatively. It has to absolutely be in the integrated plans of what must happen for the revolution to occur. In other words, you have to control the political power, the power 
from the top, to enact new laws, laws that subvert the old laws of the old system, that subvert the constitutional system that was there before, the laws that not just defined what a crime was in the United States, but also those laws that protect the people of the United States from their overreaching and possibly tyrannical government. So without a doubt, to have a revolution that is successful, you need to control the top down. Control and power, the rule of power in the federal government, or at least weaken and subvert that top position to basically take the power away from the top official. Take the power away from, in this case, the sitting president of the United States. And if you remember way back in early 2020, President Donald Trump had just survived the first impeachment that passed through the House of Representatives and failed in the Senate. But just barely. As, of course, you could count on the progressive globalist Republicans for a few votes in favor of the impeachment. And if you remember, what they had tried to impeach Donald Trump over was a phone call by Donald Trump to Ukrainian President Zelensky. Yes, and I hope the wheels in your mind are now turning. If you recall, Trump had asserted that it was the Ukrainian government that had interfered to benefit Hillary Clinton in coordination with Democrats the digital forensics company CrowdStrike, and the FBI, alleging that the Russian government had been framed. Trump also asserted that CrowdStrike was owned by a wealthy Ukrainian oligarch, which, yes, it was co-founded and controlled by a wealthy Ukrainian oligarch named Dmitry Alperovich, who, by the way, is with the World Economic Forum and the Atlantic Council. That much is true. And by the way, Fox News had Dmitry Alperovich on just the other day as an expert on Russia with Martha McCallum. I'm not kidding. So anyway, back to the story. Trump claimed that the company, which had investigated a hack of a Democratic National Committee DNC server, had planted evidence on the server to implicate Russia, and that the FBI had failed to take possession of the server to verify that claim. This entire case evolved to include allegations of corruption by Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden in their activities in Ukraine. Namely, Hunter Biden's receiving $50,000 a month for his position on the board with Burisma. In November 2019, Trump ally Senator Rand Paul extended the concerns by asserting that Colonel Vindman, who had triggered the Trump-Ukraine scandal, is a material witness to the possible corruption of Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. Which is true. This led Trump to pressure Ukrainian President Zelensky to open an investigation into the matters, which triggered the Trump-Ukraine scandal, which in turn led to the opening of an impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump. And this was an investigation that Donald Trump had sent Rudy Giuliani to dig further in Ukraine, namely that Igor Kolomoisky was in many ways facilitating and creating a ring of corruption in Ukraine, politically, financially, and otherwise. So Igor Kolomoisky had a controlling interest in Burisma Holdings. This is what the New York Post reported. Burisma employed Hunter Biden as a board member for a widely reported salary, of course, as I had just been saying, of $50,000 a month. And Russian media, quoted in State Department emails, referred to Burisma as part of Kolomoisky's financial empire. Kolomoisky publicly said in 2019 that he refused to cooperate with efforts by President Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, to get his help in investigating Hunter Biden and Burisma, and potentially Joe Biden, multiple news outlets had reported. Now, House Democrats' impeachment report on Trump also cited the incident in 2019. 
Now, emails from 2015, way back, published last year by the New York Post, show a Kolomoisky protege communicated with Hunter Biden about a meeting between the protege and Joe Biden, then vice president under president Barack Obama. Kolomoisky's former bank, private bank, also came up in court filings in a 2019 lawsuit involving Hunter Biden in Arkansas. In Arkansas? I mean, who's from Arkansas? Okay, yeah, anyway. Kolomoisky was a supporter of Ukrainian President Zelensky and owned the TV network where Zelensky previously was a comedian and an actor. In fact, it was that TV network that Zelensky... We'll get into that web of intrigue on a later show, but it goes deep. That will need a full hour of attention. But suffice to say that there were a lot of reasons why both Democrats and Republicans that had interests to the corrupt government in Ukraine and that were part of the previous attempt to use Ukraine as the new corrupt bank for their personal enrichment, as well as, after the color revolution in Ukraine, sort of a laboratory of things that were outside the eyes of others. Well, there were a lot of reasons that those people, including Republicans, wanted to make sure that Donald Trump stopped looking into Ukraine. They wanted to make sure that the eyes were off of Ukraine because some really, really evil and corrupt things were happening in Ukraine. But not only that, but the U.S. had just put the squeeze financially on China. And Trump was leading by a long way in the polls. And what Trump represented was the success of capitalism, the success of free markets, the sovereignty of nations, and the free and sovereign will of the individual, the everyman. The elite technocrat crowds call this populism. Yes, and Trump and old Nigel Farage had proven that respecting the intelligence and will of the people was much wiser than telling the people that they needed to obey tyrants that were seeking to merge them with artificial intelligence, or tyrants that wanted to bring in enviro fascism. So, Trump needed to be muted. And that raging great economy of America in 2019 needed to be muted. In fact, it needed to be disrupted and dismantled. And Trump needed to be disrupted and dismantled. So in comes the virus. And yes, in the beginning, Trump said the opposite of what the technocrats wanted him to say. He said things like, well, let's stop the flights coming in from China. He said, let's keep moving forward, though. But the reflexive virus began to dominate the news in China with fake propaganda videos of people dropping dead in the middle of the street. Do you guys remember that? And videos of people being hauled away by police for having the virus. And then all sorts of fertile fallacy reports that we know now were all fake started coming in from Italy. And they used in Italy the Chinese method on how to deal with this problem trying to show the rest of the world how this is done. Follow the way that the totalitarian tyrants do it in China. And so the pressure was on. And so Donald Trump put the responsibility of forming the coronavirus task force to... I'm sorry, to Mike Pence, who brought in the wizard of fakery and dishonesty, Anthony Fauci the high priestess of alchemy and Democrat supporter, Dr. Deborah Birx. And of course, the doctor, Dr. Jerome Adams, our Surgeon General of the United States, who came highly recommended to Donald Trump by Mike Pence. 
You see, Dr. Jerome Adams served as Mike Pence's Surgeon General when he was the governor of Indiana. And if you didn't know this, Mike Pence's Jerome Adams was one of the leading proponents in the nation of what is known as health equity, which, of course, we refer to as medical Marxism. The practice of health infused with critical social justice, critical race theory, and intersectionality. This was the team that the head of the new coronavirus task force, Mike Pence, put together at the request, the honest request of President Donald Trump, because he just wanted to beat this thing. And just as this was all happening, I held a dinner in Washington, D.C., in a private room at the Trump International Hotel, with about 30 people in attendance. The two presenters were myself and Dr. James Lindsay. And we had all sorts of folks from the State Department, the Defense Department, and the White House at that dinner. And Dr. Lindsay and I were both trying to warn our esteemed guest at that dinner that an American cultural revolution, a Marxist revolution, was about to be sprung on the United States. And they weren't ready for it. I explained afterwards at the dinner to a few that were there that I had grave concerns about their coronavirus task force. And as we left Washington, D.C. in early March, I began to see something that very much concerned me. What I saw was a team that was being formed around President Trump by Mike Pence that did not have the best interests of this nation in mind. As a matter of fact, this team did not have the best interests of President Trump in mind. And as this began moving forward, and as the scenario for a reset for an American culture revolution, for what Dr. Lindsay and I warned them about in our dinner in Washington, D.C., starting to come together, with some very recognizable names, by the way, literally falling asleep while Dr. Lindsay and I were giving our warnings, it became pretty clear to me that Donald Trump and our nation was being set up. In a Kafka trap. In fact, my exact text to Special White House Counsel was, quote, POTUS is being placed in a Kafka trap by his own team. And so, just like it was in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, I played the role of the soothsayer. And I said, quote, Beware the Ides of March. And that was on a text on March 15th, 2020. The Ides of March. And within 14 hours, President Trump, with Brutus and Cassius standing behind him, Brutus being Mike Pence and Cassius being Anthony Fauci. The friends of Caesar. They effectively put the wheels in motion to end the presidency of Donald Trump on that day. And every time that Peter Navarro or President Trump brought up questions or concerns about the wildly inaccurate or downright Marxist strategies to beat the dreaded virus... They were dismissed by the experts of Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and Dr. Adams. And it wasn't just the end of President Donald Trump. It was the end of the American engine of capitalism and liberty throughout the world. It was the beginning of the end 
of the United States. Today is March 15th, 2022. Beware the Ides of March. I explained this entire deconstruction of America and the whole tie-in with the Ides of March to one of President Trump's attorneys just recently. And within just seconds, I could see the sinking realization in the eyes of recognizing that this entire stupid charade has been symbolic and has been purposeful. And we, as a people, who are becoming less and less free by the minute, must realize that when we don't act and when we don't respond to the ever-encroaching tyranny, the darkness of the totalitarians advances more, day by day, week by week. And then they spring their traps and dismantle our nation disrupt and dismantle our world. We, for some insane reason, think that they are just going to stop soon and that things are going to go back to normal. No, they won't. But we are the ones that need to speak. We are the ones that need to act. And we are the ones that need to take control of our futures. And we need to make sure that our adversaries will beware the Ides of March. Because we, we must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences Both Foreign and Domestic.